What is the most expensive word in business today? That wasn't a question. What is the most expensive word in business today? What's going on? Exactly. But we'll get back to that. Because what's not only going on in there? Can you repeat that? I can't hear you. It's going on everywhere, all the time. I'm trying to tell you right and now. And if it can happen here, hello, hello, it can happen anywhere. Is this better? Can you hear me? Hello. What? The world is getting smaller. They say we're communicating 24/7 with everyone from Tokyo to Timbuktu. Yet we all just accept this obvious problem. Sorry, what seems to be the problem? It seems so. Look, what is holding you back? That's not what I ordered. Hello? Hello? What causes mistakes? Yeah, I'm outside waiting for my car. Oh, here he is. What the? All sorts of mistakes. What takes time? And we all know what time is. What? 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 Hello? What? Niech pan proszę powtórzy. What is this? Oh, In here, no one accepts a what. And neither should you. I know what you're thinking. Get to the point, Jack. Okay. Bottom line is this. We optimize everything in our business life from the way we travel to the way we work. So why would we accept this? At EPOS, we're on a mission. A mission to create crystal clear audio and flawless communication. A mission to put what out of business? Sorry, what? Well, maybe not all what's. EPOS, the power of audio. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the EPOS virtual conference, the new age of hybrid work, co-organized by EPOS and South China Morning Post. My name is Yvonne Chan, and I'll be your moderator for today. Now, the COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated digital adoption at the workplace, and some companies are now planning for hybrid work, which combines remote work and face time in the office for the long term as part of their business transformation. Meanwhile, some Asian countries have taken advantage of this accelerated digital adoption driven in part by the pandemic, as well as safe distancing measures to promote flexi work arrangements. However, Asia tops the world in terms of population density. And a majority of our workforce here live in relatively smaller spaces compared to our Western counterparts. So what kind of technological infrastructure, company policies, or new skills are required to make this work from home revolution a success? Well, today's conference convenes business leaders and experts to explore how companies in Asia can redesign their existing technological infrastructure, implement supporting policies, and reskill their employees to achieve a successful transition to the new age of hybrid work. Before we begin, though, I just want to share some quick tips and tricks to ensure that your participation in today's conference will be as seamless as possible. Now, you can pose questions to our panelists at any time by using the Q&A icon. And you can also vote for your most favorite question by clicking on the thumbs up button. Our panelists will do their best to respond to your questions during the 10 minute Q&A for each segment. We'd also like to invite you to take part in rich discussions during the conference by going to the chat box function. And do remember to click on the everyone in the chat box so that all participants can take part in the conversation. And now with that out of the way, uh, let's begin because we have an exciting agenda lined up for you today. So we're going to start with an opening keynote. After that, we will move on to our first panel discussion today to talk about thriving in a tech enabled workspace. South China Morning Post will then present their case study on a hybrid work model. We will then take a quick five minute break. When we come back, we'll move on to panel two to discuss whether the hybrid work model can present a win-win for both employers and employees. And then we will wrap for a closing keynote. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Xia Hongkiet, the Vice President of Enterprise Solutions APAC at EPOS for his opening address. Hongkiet, please. Thank you, Yvonne. 
afternoon to everyone. It is my great pleasure to be a part of today's event, the new age of hybrid work. I'm super excited with our lineup of distinguished speakers and really looking forward to some good learnings and sharing. In views of today's team, how has the pandemic upended the way we work and communicate? I hope many of us will agree that the pandemic has thrown us into a dramatically different future of work. There's a rise in demand for connectivity and collaboration, which has moved the needle on digital workplace maturity. Communication tools have suddenly seen high adoption in a short time offering. Today, we're seeing a more distributed workforce with some continuing to work remotely as well as others returning to office gradually. That brings me to my next point. How do we define a hybrid workplace? Hybrid workplace is defined as working wherever you are, in your office, at home, or on the go. And as workforce become exceptionally fluid and dynamic, that opens up many opportunities for companies to reshape work and bring about efficiency that improves productivity. As, workplace, as hybrid workplace becomes the new norm, what do companies need to consider and plan for their work, workforce? Companies will be tested on their ability to review their IT infrastructure, their company policies, and workforce rescaling quickly to adapt to this new age of hybrid work. With that, I'll hand you back to Yvonne to continue with this event proper. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Hong Kiet, for setting the scene for us. Indeed, there are lots of things to consider. Stay with us, though, because we're going to move on to our first panel for today to talk about how we can thrive in a tech-enabled workspace. OK, so we have a few fun facts for you. Did you know that about 5 million people will be using a co-working space by 2024? That's a mere three years from now, and 158% jump from 2020. And this is according to the Global Coworking Growth Study that was just published last year. So as the hybrid work environment becomes more commonplace, workspaces need to adapt and evolve to not having everyone in the same space. Similarly, the trend of people using co-working spaces where your premises and your equipment are shared is expected to increase. And so collaboration, and communication will become even more of a challenge in running organizations at all scales. So how do we get about this conundrum? Well, today we're very honored to have with us Heather Emsley, the APEC Director at Google Workspace, join us. I also like to invite uh, Kong Wan Long, the CMO and co-founder of JustCo. And we want to welcome back Xia Hong Kiet, the Vice President of Enterprise Solutions, APAC at EPOS, to join me for this next discussion. A very good afternoon, Heather Wan Long, Hong Kiet. Okay, now on a scale of of one to 10. Okay, I see all of you on the screen, so that's really good. Scale of one to 10, please give me your personal poll rating uh, on the current model of tech assisted remote work. So this poll of one to 10, 10 being the happiest. How do you think we're faring on that front? And give me your rationale for choosing that number. Let's start with you first, Heather. Right, so um, personally, I would say I'm at an eight, but I've been fortunate. I've had the infrastructure in place that has supported this hybrid or remote type working, whether it's been because I've been traveling on a mobile device, et cetera. I think there's a lot of people that are less fortunate than me. So probably in a five situation because they don't have the right environment. So that's space equipment tools, but also policies in place in the companies that they work for uh, to do these kinds of jobs easily using a tech assisted uh, environment. So you're at an eight for yourself, given where you're currently working, but your um, assessment of others would probably at a five. Thank you, Heather. Yeah. One long, what about you? Personally, I think uh, I'll give it a nine to 10. You know, at the start, I was thinking maybe two or three, but uh -huh. during the COVID, it has truly convinced me that actually we're at a nine or 10. Realistically speaking, you know, I'm very impressed with how technology has helped remote working so far, especially during the COVID period where everyone was forced to stay at home most of the time. If not because of this COVID, I wouldn't even have realized that, you know, we have all the technologies in place to be adopted to enable us to work so efficiently. So for me, 
I think of course, uh, similarly to Heather, I think I'm also very fortunate to be based in Singapore where the infrastructure is so robust and to, for all this technology to take place in a maximized way, optimized way, yeah. That's pretty optimistic. I like that. Nine to 10. Uh, Hong Kie, please give me your personal poll rating. I'm, I'm taking notes here, by the way, guys. <laughs> right. So uh, my own personal assessment is we're at seventh, which means, seventh. yes, okay. which means that uh, I think the current tech-assisted remote work environment is enough to get work going, but more can be done. Now, why do I say that? Think about when all this started. Many of us have literally been thrown into the work from home environment by default during the COVID lockdown. And quite evidently for many, including myself, the early pain points was about right sizing IT hardware and software. But fortunately with uh, cloud technology, as well as unified communications, the employees can easily be set up remotely to stay connected. But is that enough? Surely more can be done to facilitate. And I guess today session is for all of us to learn ways to get better at thriving in tech assisted remote work environment. That's exactly why we have you guys on the panel right now. So I can pick your brains and get some viewpoints uh, to share with our audience today. Heather, I wanna direct this next question to you, yeah? As a workplace solutions provider, what are the collaboration tools um, is Google Workspace coming up with? Is it, are there new tools or functionalities that have been introduced as a result of this latent demand that has arisen from this hybrid work environment? Yeah, so I think over the last year, we actually had to reprioritize a lot of the features in our, our product roadmaps to bring forward a lot of our meat functionality. So in, in that, we released things like noise cancellation, noise cancellation, which I think for us working at home, many think that's a great tool to help keep the dogs and the kids in the quiet out. But as we move forward, it's also a, a fantastic feature if you look at manufacturing environments and retail stores where you want to still have that video quality engagement with a supervisor, et cetera, um, without the noise of the storefront or of the manufacturing floor. So noise cancellation was one. Meeting captions was another. Blur and replace background, a big, big ask for. Meeting translation. And then our number one ask this time last year was the grid view. So we went from having a couple of um, couple of panels within the view, but as time has gone, we've we've introduced a 49, I think it's 40, 49 uh, view where you can see up to 49 people on a single view. And that's just, I think that comes from a lot of people using more video and wanting to see reactions, et cetera. Mm. To, What's coming and what are some of the things we're continuing to evolve in this space? Um, I'm very excited about the meet in picture view and how we're bringing meet into our collaboration tools like docs, sheets, and slides. So where we could be working in a collaborative document, in, in a document collaborating in real time, which is something that Google's well known for, but really the area that's missing is when you're working in remote is how do I bring this video in so I can chat, I can talk through it as opposed to us sitting around a table all typing in a document. So that's gonna be released in, in, next, in the next month. And I'm really excited to see how that's going to really change the way we collaborate. Very exciting. I, I can't wait to see that too. Do we get first dips here for us on the call? Can we can, can we try that out too? Okay, Heather, putting my hand up here. I want to be part of that. Um, one low, you know, while remote work still remains very much the new reality, it seems that queries for JustCo have returned to about 85% of pre-pandemic rates. Can you tell me what other emerging opportunities are out there right now for workspace providers like yourself uh, and tenants in this hybrid work environment? Yeah, indeed. Uh, it is a very exciting time for us, especially uh, we look back into last year during April when most countries are facing the lockdown. People are having the cautious mentality and very careful, not sure what the world is going to get into. And I think, you know, uh, for myself and even our industry, we were also very careful and very cautious at that time. So like what you say uh, and what we mentioned is 85% uh, going back to the traction that we had during uh, compared to the pre-COVID, it is very encouraging. And being as one of the Asia 
fastest growing workspace experience innovator. It's a long word, but you know, <laughs> but I think the concept of workspace, uh, the key is truly the flexibility. And so far we have been advocating this concept to our clients for not just the past one, two years. Actually, we have been doing it for the past 10 years, even before COVID-19. However, you see with COVID-19, it has truly accelerated the implementation of flexible work arrangements. Yes. Businesses, individuals truly also realize the beauty of uh, working from anywhere and the benefits of workspaces that offers maximum flexibility. So the keywords here are truly working from anywhere mm. because they are trying to find, uh, adopt new way and adaptive to this new way of working concept. Mm -hmm. uh, we are also always offering uh, this truly a uh, hybrid workspace solution, allowing businesses to combine the use of not just the core, but also with the flexible options that include uh, hot desking or even pay as you use platforms. So hot desking was probably the truly the in thing for the past two to three years. Yeah. But for what we are looking at is people are looking at probably to the extreme of uh, pay as you use to the minutes rather than months. Oh. Yeah. So I thought that is truly groundbreaking from my point of view because uh, people are looking at that sense. And I think increasingly we also notice that enterprises are always out there breaking out their traditional real estate model, uh, reimagining how their real estate should be and looking for solution that can, you know, prove, future proof their real estate business strategy. One that can withstand adverse uh, business conditions. And I would say this has been truly a key driving factor in terms of uh, the increased demand that we have seen over the past, I would say the past one to two quarters. Mm. So now you're actually considering pay pay per use to the very minute. To the very minute, yes. Oh my gosh, yeah. how flexible can you be, right? I mean, at some point in time. Okay, so uh, keep that in mind. I want to come back to that in a little bit. Right. But you know, as you have more people also working in these co-working um, arrangements, uh, I think my issue for me is really sound because I'm always wondering whether I'm going to be disturbed by others around me. And so I want to bring Hong Kiet into this conversation as well. A research from EPOS suggests that as much as 95% of today's workforce has, has admitted that their concentration and efficiency have suffered due to audio setbacks. So in this context, how can technology providers like EPOS uh, provide a solution to this communications challenge when we're working in a hybrid environment? Yes, thanks. Uh... Uh, Yvonne. So at the start of this event, we have uh, screened a video uh, and that clearly illustrated bad audio is bad business. So today's workforce demands audio that enhances the work experience to ensure we deliver the results. And hybrid workplace demands efficient remote collaboration. The key to delivering that is quality connection, connectivity as well as good audio and increasingly video too. So yes, based on our research, many businesses are suffering because of excessive background noise, uh, lost connections, and bad audio. It makes them feel frustrated and their customers feel uncomfortable. Yeah. So how does ePOS help provide audio solution to these challenges? Mm. Our audio devices empower you to not only hear, but fully understand everything being said from explicitly stated information the implicit details carried by pauses and tone of voice. Mm -hmm. So with e solutions, users can also be confident that their messages are being delivered loud and clear. So thanks to adaptive noise cancellation and enhanced speech technologies. Mm. So it's the adaptive noise cancellation that is helping to uh, helping users eliminate all the sounds around, right? Background noise, and this could help them uh, promote better workplace well-being as well, isn't it, Hong Kiet? Oh, definitely, definitely. And if I may, uh, just add on a little. Yeah. So, technology, as we as we know, is developing at a very fast pace across all industry. So the audio and the video collaboration area are no different. Yeah. We just need to find the best way to unleash it. 
So take the scenario of a customer service consultant working from home and speaking with their customers about you know, their financial details or what have you. They cannot afford any background noise to creep in, like children sh shouting or you know, dog barking in the background. They must retain utmost professionalism at all times. So these are the kind of customer use cases that we looked at and say, hey, uh, what can technology do to ensure we keep these customers and users happy? And sound affects us psychologically and behaviorally, even if you're not aware. So exposure to bad sound uh, can inevitably wear an individual down and causing brain fatigue. And when extrapolated over a long period, spending days, weeks, or months, what have you, this can have a detrimental impact on your well-being. Yeah, and our survey shows 69% of our respondents actually spend extra time on your work tasks due to poor sound quality. So as an outcome, efficiency and productivity will be impacted. But help is here. So our R&D team created EPOS AI, a tiny yet powerful network that we have established using deep learning. This being a subset of machine learning in which artificial neuron networks learn from large amount of data, similar to how we've learned from experience. This deep learning algorithm perform a task repeatedly, each time ordering it a little to improve the outcome. So using this technology allows EPOS AI to distinguish human voice from other external sounds. So whether you're in a busy cafe or in a car or just in a loud open plan office, the EPOS AI will continuously optimize the pickup of the user's voice, helping them to be heard clearly. Yeah. So very, some very smart and innovative technology there. And I have to agree, I think the power of audio when it comes to communication can't be overstated. And I'm sure many of us here on uh, this conference today, in this conference today, will be very familiar with these two most uttered lines from last year, can you hear me? Or the other hated one, you're on mute. Okay, so power of audio, so important, right? Uh, Heather, let's bring you back to the conversation too. As an employer, can you describe to me what your, your physical workspace is like? And also uh, tell me what are some of the tech challenges that Google Workspace has encountered with this new hybrid work environment? Okay, so um, firstly, first and foremost, from, from a Google perspective, we've always prided ourselves on our workspaces. Um, and we've encouraged employees to come into the office, even though we've always had this tech that supported us to work from anywhere. This, our workspaces has often been an, a thing that has attracted people to come work at, at, at Google. Um, and it's just something that is part of the DNA. Our offices are built with spaces for collaboration that have both informal type uh, well, that are built for informal as well as formal collaboration. So you'll find a lot of little hubs, coffee coffee stations, etc., cetera, uh, food, food areas where you can grab a quick snack, grab and go, have a, have a chat. So there's a lot of space to try and facilitate that conversation and collaboration. But then we've also got the quiet spaces where you can go and do some of your best work. So there's areas that I can go in into a pod or an area and work in a quiet zone so that I can get some individual work done as well. We are look, re-looking at some of this moving forward um, and how we support people who've seen the benefits of working at home. From a, from a tech perspective, um, we've had to start looking at how do we facilitate hybrid work. So we've started looking at things like building in building in features that allow you to block out multiple uh, spaces in your diary to not just have an eight hour workday, but you may have a block in the middle of the day, which you need to take out to do certain things. So there may be different blocks that you're available and not available. In addition, having different types of where your locations built into our functionality. So whether I'm working from, a, from home, I'll be in the office this day, and making that available to others so that they know what kind of meeting or what kind of schedule um, to, to schedule with you. Mm. So that's what we're doing from, from a product perspective. 
some of the challenges from a tech perspective, um, and it's, I wouldn't say this is Google specific, but it's, it's ubiquitous across the board. So security. Um, suddenly in this remote environment, everyone was, was flourishing to get some sort of video conferencing solution. But often what was happening is they were getting solutions that were con uh, contravening security policies, things that they didn't allow in the past. So how do you remote, how do you manage a device in a remote environment in order to, um, when it's not on your network, how do you make sure your company data is secure? So that's come up quite a lot and it's one of those conversa conversations we've had. Another one is support of users. So most people, computer breaks or you have an IT question, you walk down to the IT help desk or uh, in some areas we've got online bots and things like that. Also onboarding people, how do you get PCs to people? Those that, that whole dimension has been something that firstly we were challenged with as an organization, as well as other our customers as well. And then the last area, there, there are a lot, but the last one has been about legacy applications. How do you take an application which was built to be to function in a corporate network? So like the old client server type environments and make that available outside of the firewall. So applications that facilitate VPN, which is a common te technology or virtual desktop, can be clunky, but organizations have had to look at some of these, um, these technologies to overcome some challenges in remote work. Mm. Thanks for highlighting uh, some of these challenges for us. And you're absolutely right. I think uh, security is a ubiquitous challenge uh, faced by all. And it's really quite a big one to tackle when you have so many people working in different environments. It's not under one controlled office environment. So definitely some work that needs to go, more research needs to go into that arena. Uh, I just want to say thank you for all the questions that are coming in. I do see some great ones. We will get to them as soon as we can, just uh, in a little, a little bit more but please keep your questions coming in for our panelists. Thank you so much. Now, Wan Long, given the changing mode of hybrid work, um, I want to know, how is JustCo now repackaging your offerings to attract new tenants? Are there specific uh, technologies or facilities that uh, clients are now requesting for before they sign with you? So of course, I think over the past year, we do see that uh, the behavior of our consumer has been changing rapidly. Uh, it has been in a very fast pace. So our mandate is actually to provide a platform that enables anyone to have the best work-life experience anywhere, anytime. So we do this in three ways, three elements that we look at it. First, innovative products. Secondly, pondering our clients in redesigning how they consume real, real estate spaces, which means that we want them to reimagine how we can help them in terms of the real, real estate perspective. And lastly, which is offer them the maximum flexibility, like what I said, uh, could we uh, give them real estate by the minute, charge them by the minute so that there's no wastage. And I think so far, uh, innovation has truly played a key role in our success for the past 10 years since we started JustCo. And we continue to uh, introduce intuitive solutions that help our members achieve increased efficiencies while keeping their bottom line in check. For instance, uh, last quarter we launched Switch, which is the world's first on-demand workspace platform allowing users to pay by the minutes for their usage of the space, which essentially is an app for you to log in and choose the nearest workspace for you to check in. So you check in, tap, use the QR code, tap in, uh, and then when you tap out, it just charges you by the minute and you pay by the minutes. It could be, so, so, so it could be you paying $2.22 for that, couple of minutes, 20 minutes that you use. And most importantly, is in a very secure professional setting, uh, unlike of course, some of the cafes that we have been. So we continue to help our clients to redesign their real estate strategy by providing platforms such as Switch, and that not only boosts employee satisfaction, drives productivity, but I think most importantly for a lot of real estate uh, people out there is also to maximize their cost savings and 
uh, of course, business excellence. Mm -hmm. So I think beauty of uh, JustCo or our any of uh, our you know our peers in this industry is that we try to provide members with maximum flexibility to upsize and most importantly to right size their office spaces so that there's no wastage, which is what our clients need when it comes to scaling their business. By further strengthening, uh, building on our hybrid core and flex work solutions offerings, uh, companies will enjoy a combination of uh, permanent office and on-demand workspace options by the main. So this is a mixture combination of both, depending on the, uh, the, the strategy that the enterprises or the company occupiers want to deploy. Mm. So there's a lot of flexibility that I see you introducing. And like you said, it's about uh, maximizing your cost efficiency. So instead of paying for a block, an hour block, where you're not utilizing right. the full 60 minutes, you just use pay for that 20 minutes. But are you investing in any new technologies as well? Uh, yes, indeed we are. So uh, originally we are just a co-working uh, a, a provider, but we do see that, like what you see, uh, how could we give a, how could we formulate an even better hybrid work for a lot of workforce out there? And that's when technology has to play their part. Okay. So if you look back five years ago, people look at co-working spaces as just like temporary solutions. But now what we are trying to achieve is could this become an essential part of strategy for your enterprise, for your company? And that's the conversation we are having today compared to five years ago. We do see there's a big shift in that type of behavior in how people are accepting uh, this flexible type of workspace. Speaking of a big shift in behavior, behavioral trends and the questions that are being asked at Honkiet, I want to know how do you see consumer trends and audio solutions evolving going forward, especially when we have more employees now working remotely? Yeah, certainly. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, most of us, you know, being thrown into work from home by default at the start of a COVID lockdown, you know, after a year, I think many of us has gotten smarter in knowing the audio pain points uh, that, that arises from work from home. But having to shift into a hybrid work style, we've certainly seen consumer demanding for high performance enterprise grade headset with uh, active noise cancellation, long talk time, multi-point connectivity, wireless, just to name a few. Thus, these consumers are turning away from a cheaper or off-the-shelf models and investing in quality audio equipment, knowing that it simply works and kills uh, as much audio pain points as possible. Now, looking to the future, we need to, think, we need to be thinking beyond the pandemic to a world of hybrid work and learning. The next generation of employees and students may never know what it is like to step into a cram, public transport, work from an overcrowded office uh, space or learning in an overcrowded auditorium. Instead, they will expect seamless connection and communication from wherever they work. So wherever hybrid work takes you, EPOS has the sound technology to enable professionalism anytime. And lastly, what's also apparent is that smart employees have a greater awareness of communication style. They really care about what they use and have strong feelings about designs and functionality. At EPOS, we encourage smart investment in premium audio solution as it carries with it a degree of future proving too. Mm. Future proofing and uh, what what a future workforce would know would be that of a very seamless connection uh, in this kind of new hybrid workspace. But I do think everyone should have the experience of uh, going through the Google pantry. That one is legendary, right, Heather? I mean, when I went to Google's office, it was all about, oh, you have so much food in your office. They couldn't even leave. <laughs> Heather, coming back to you, uh, based on the feedback from your users, can you tell me what are uh, what seems to be the most uh, uh, popular functionalities in the Singapore as well as the APEC market? So um, I'll start off with what what struck well what one of the areas that struck me at first. But chat chat is actually one of the most popular um, features we're seeing and 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 you where we see quite a lot of use usability. And you can see that from the number of different consumer apps we have across the region. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a Google Chat thing. It's a a Kaka thing. It's a it's a WhatsApp. Everyone has got 
likes to use chat to engage. Um, I'm also starting to see this actually transcend into meetings where people, I, I find sometimes because of either language barrier or confidence, a lot more people like to use the chat feature to either respond or add a comment into, into a discussion versus coming off mute and, and asking the question. Mm. So things like our Q&A feature is one of the areas where I feel that we're seeing a lot more usage of that then people coming off the mic. Also in large groups, that that really, really helps a lot. In addition, forms, electronic forms is coming through. It was something that's been there for ages, but it started peaking again, where it's another way to collect feedback. uh, Because you can't just pass someone in the corridor and say, hey, what do you think about this? Hey, what do you, you know, it's it's another way to get feedback and be able to action certain things um, in there. I also um, mentioned earlier, uh, no, sorry. So we're also seeing AI and bots coming into the market. Now, this is not my area of expertise, but there was a case earlier this month where HSBC actually uh, implemented a chatbot. And what the the chatbot did is it went through and interrogated uh, all the policy information of the various regions that they work in. Now, you might say, well, yes, but what they realized is that often time zones and being conscious of where people are and getting timely information and accurate information based on um, time zones required storing the knowledge base and using these bots in order to save time, get a better view on the market, et cetera. So that's another area that I'm seeing um, some of the, the technology evolving over this time. Thank you, Heather. Uh, very enlightening one there. And I have to say, I am also very, very big on chat. I mean, here in Asia, it's always about the chat. And um, yeah, right. It's, it's, I think it's very useful to have the Q&A function when people just type out their questions. And I'm seeing so many questions come in. Thank you, guys. Keep them coming in. We're going to go to our Q&A very shortly. Wan Long, can you tell me now, too, what are some of the struggles that you have encountered from a, a co-working space startup perspective? And how is JustCo and your employees continuing to adapt to these evolving changes. Like you said, five years ago, you never had that conversation, you know, about have offering even this flex and core with your clients, but now this is an intrinsic part of what you're offering. So in the early days, uh, I, I would say the concept of co-working was relatively new to Asia. Like what I mentioned, when people talk about co-working, it has to be because you are a small office, you, you, you need a small office, you have a small setup, transition spaces, things are not talking about moving your HQ or something that is more in a bigger scale. So although it was, at that time, although it was already a rising phenomenon, you know, in Western countries, but over the years, we spent a lot of our early days researching what work didn't work for co-working providers and what our education we have to give out to help people, like what I say, the flexibility benefits uh, or even the type of uh, satisfaction you can get out from working in a co-working setup. And to add on to some of the struggles that we had is, you know, uh, localization because we have grew to nine cities over the past 10 years. And I think localization plays a big part as well. Mm -hmm. Every country, they have a different needs and they have a different uh, demand. So we hire a lot of local teams who have local expertise to run our operation in the regions. These help us to overcome a lot of uh, nuances that were specific to each market. And I believe uh, these challenges are faced by a lot of expanding business as well. Yeah, and from a landlord perspective, we spend a fair amount of time, like what I say, uh, to explaining them and educating our business concept to them. As it was a model that was different from traditional offices through our efforts and you know evolved demands and businesses uh, landlord are also now looking for us to help them to see if we can manage their office rental spaces mm-hmm. and i think that businesses also uh, were traditionally less receptive towards the concept of co working environments and of course uh, thanks to covid uh, the adoption rate has been accelerated and more businesses are appreciating the value of this model brings, uh, in, including the increased you know, cost efficiency, like what I mentioned earlier, and 
uh, the productivity that you can get out from it. So localization, localization is kind of key to ironing out the key right. and you're also expanding into other different markets. So thanks, Wan Long. And uh, just very quickly, Hong Kiet, we live in population dense Asia, uh, where our homes are relatively smaller than that of our Western counterparts. So how can audio solutions then come in to fill the gap when it comes to uh, promoting better hearing health, you know, eliminating the dogs barking, dustbin trucks, uh, just to ensure that we have that seamless experience that you talk about? Yes, indeed. Well, yes, in a small city like Singapore, space is indeed a luxury. And a high percentage of residents in Singapore live in a high-rise apartment. But the good news is that sound is not necessarily impacted due to smaller space. We have experienced larger rooms producing more unwanted sound due to echoes and ambient noises. So the key lies in finding great audio solutions to help manage your sound environment. And to your point about uh, a better hearing health, mm -hmm. yes, I think that is firstly to start, you know, with using a high quality headset that can provide you all day wearing comfort with greater noise cancellation to reduce your brain fatigue. And lastly, one that has seamless connectivity, long battery performance to last you through the day wherever work takes you to. Thanks, Hong Kia. Definitely, I think uh, ambient noise uh, as well as echo is something that I would like to cut out from uh, many of the conversations that we have. Okay, I wanna go to the Q&A right now because I, I see some great questions coming in. Remember guys, uh, you can vote for your favorite question by clicking on the thumbs up button and we will get to that one first. So this first one from Morali, can hybrid work, can a hybrid work framework be adopted in all sectors, especially when we're talking about tourism or banking? Uh, who would like to answer this first question? Maybe it's Heather, someone, something for you, do you think? Yeah, um, I'll take a stab at it. Mm -hmm. I don't think every sector will lend itself. There are some sectors where you're going to need human power in specific locations, etc. But uh, it was interesting, and this is not my quote, we had Kenny from Korean Air on an internal customer panel talking about where he sees tourism going. And he sees the role of uh, virtual reality actually starting to play quite a big role in terms of tourism without um, necessarily maybe getting on an airplane. So being able to experience a place without physically being there using technology like uh, virtual reality. Uh, so that, that's just to address the tourism side. But we've also had scenarios where we've started speaking to banks and insurance brokers and looking at how we digitize the experience of signing a loan, whether it's a um, a mortgage loan, a car loan, et cetera, um, using digital channels, digital signatures, but you still want that human engagement. So you're using video in those scenarios. And then um, to share an example from us uh, at Kia, Kia uh, Motors, actually have started doing online, online showrooms to, show, to actually start selling cars during this pandemic. It's been less accepted in Asia, but we're actually seeing big take up in the Middle East where people... They've, people have actually bought cars without going into a showroom, but using v video technology to show the car, give them the experience and go through that experience in order to make that, that, that sale. So it is possible. I think you need to imagine it. I still think there's going to be some human element. Sometimes when I go in, I want to try on a dress. I want to speak to a salesperson when I'm buying certain expensive items, yeah. but there are other elements where technology will definitely play a role. Yeah, that's a great example. Such an immersive, you really need an immersive experience to want to buy a car online. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's one that really needs a very high touch points, right? I, I hope that's answered your question, Morali. I, I want to go to uh, the next question here, and it says for Morali too. Does your company look into the mental health of your employees uh, for those that work from home? Would any of you like to touch on this just very briefly? Because we'll be talking about that in more detail uh, for our second panel discussion. Perhaps one long. Uh, I would like to just quickly add on to the first questions. Okay, yeah, of, sure. Uh, in terms of the tourism, I, I thought that maybe I can contribute a little bit from a, a, a provider point of view. Mm -hmm. So I think for the past six months, uh, in terms of the uh, the observation I've seen is, it's not it, it actually all sectors are reimagining 
how their real estate workspace is, can be uh, because of how this COVID has changed the behavior. So if you were to ask me, can it be tourism, can it be banking or any other industry? I certainly think so from the, the trend that I'm looking at. Mm-hmm. Uh, it really depends on uh, what are the departments uh, made up of within your organization. Uh, for example, uh, recently I just spoken to some of the big, biggest banks in the world. Uh, they are telling me, hey, you know what, one long, uh, now my people doesn't want to come back to work and I have empty seats. Uh, uh, I have empty seats within the sales department. I'm looking at 20% occupancy within that section. What can I do? I told them that, you know, uh, you might want to look at hybrid work for this department mm. because uh, you are having some wastage over there. And subsequently, he also asked me, hey, you know what, could we do that for HR department or maybe finance department? I told him that, you know, uh, that probably, if you want to do it, you might want to roll out in a less conservative manner, mm. a more conservative, more conservative manner, mainly because... Uh, I would expect 80% or 90% of people come back to office and they still require space uh, most of the time for that couple of departments. So it's about how to, uh, uh, I, I think hybrid solutions could be applied to all industries. Uh, it really depends on the function of uh, that department if it is suitable for that rather than just industry uh, 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 perspective. Yeah. So it's not a blanket one size fits all, exactly. isn't it? like you said, it's a targeted approach. And I like that tweak where you say, okay, there's this department, no one's coming back in, what can we do with this space? So let's maybe farm it out to other different departments and make that hybrid work situation um, work, right? Use that as right. a solution. Great. Thank you, Wan Long. Thank you. Great example. And I saw Heather uh, nodding emphatically there too to your response. Morali, your second question on well-being, I'm going to keep that for our second panel because we're, I'm watching the clock here and I want to get to some of the questions here for our guests, okay? Uh, this one from uh, Brian. How should employers measure the return of investment on the technological infrastructure of a hybrid workplace? Is that quite difficult to do? How, how soon can we do that? Anybody want to take a stab at this one? Heather or Wanlo? Sorry, sorry, Yvonne, I was looking at the, the, the Q&A. So would you no, mind? Yeah, yeah, Brian says, how should employers measure the return of investment on the technological infrastructure of a hybrid workplace? Oh, I think this is a question for finance. but It is um, quite difficult, yeah, to measure the return of investment for this one, isn't it? Look, I think that if you just do the pure numbers, um, you would want to look at space saving uh, over time, reutilization of real estate, um, and and how by giving people a semi-remote type environment can help you reduce costs in your environment. This is why this is also difficult maybe for me to answer. I've always worked in a hot desk scenario. So when I was at, at Microsoft, even before that at J.D. Edwards, and now at Google, we've had hot desking and you use meeting or, or, or office space, as you would call it. There's no formal offices, it's, at least in Asia, there's not. Mm. That, those are meeting rooms where you collaborate and you do formal collaboration. So I think for organizations where there's real estate that are divide, defined for office that's not being used, you would want to relook at how you leverage those spaces to more optimize there. I think also then there's other things like employee well-being, which you can't really put a number to. But that's true. Places like Indonesia, I remember speaking to my teams. Some of them were taking three hours to travel to and from their office, and then in India it takes two hours to get anywhere. So you get three customer meetings in a day if you're lucky, maybe four. Whereas today we need to just help with time management, but you can actually do a lot more. So productivity levels also go up. So it's a difficult one to measure, but those are some things to consider. Yeah, definitely some food for thought there. Thank you so much, Heather, for taking a stab at that question. Uh, Thank you, Brian, for your question too. This next question from John to Wan Long. What is the premium or the increasing cost on the per minute charge for co-working space versus uh, a longer term membership? Right. It's a very good question uh, because I get, asked a lot by my customers. So 
in terms of unit economic, definitely the longer term you sign, definitely it becomes more, the, the price becomes better. I think that is the logic of any products that, or, or the terms that you can commit or you want to buy. So, but the question becomes when I always ask my, uh, my customer is, how long do you actually use your space? Even if you commit with me a uh, one month term, how long would you usually be in that office? And a lot of time when I get back, the question is, you know, I always spend about 40% of the time of the office. You know, I only spend 10% of the time of the office, things like that. Uh, then the next question I ask them is, hmm, have you ever thought about, you know, just pay that 10% of the time that you spend in the office? But I just charge you slightly higher in terms of unit economics. And in, in return, you're paying lesser monthly fee compared to a higher uh, monthly fee that you don't really utilize on. So it really depends on how much time do you want to commit per month and uh, compare with the unique economy of per minutes that we are charging. So for me to answer the question short is, if you are using your, if you're going to your office 60 to 70% of the time, I think you want to commit a longer term, be it one month, two months. But if you're only because of, you see how COVID has change the way that we will. We usually spend time only 10%, 15% of time in the office. Then I would say, you know, pay per minute might not be a bad alternative for you. All right. Well, thanks, Wan Long. And there you have it, John. Two alternative solutions for you to consider, right? Do you spend more time in the office or do you spend a lot less time in your physical uh, right. office? Okay. Thanks, Wan Long. Uh, this next question, perhaps for uh, Hong Kiet, how do you see the role of audio only solutions like Clubhouse for corporations in the future? Do you see a lot more um, organizations leaning towards Clubhouse to care? I mean, it is right, pretty revolutionary. Uh, Clubhouse. So do you see organizations moving towards Clubhouse to get meetings done, to get ideas across, and maybe they may not even be mm -hmm. using Zoom anymore to conduct webinars, or do you call it like Clubhouse <laughs> conversations, Hong Kiet? Yeah, well, I think Clubhouse is kind of revolutionizing the way people are coming together. Uh, you know, from time to time, we, we really see a lot of players coming into this uh, arena to offer, uh, you know, many ways of people coming together. I think what's important also is for organization to consider, uh, are this environment safe? Are this environment compliance? You know, and you know, really um, uh, organizations uh, would like a uh, infrastructure that they could also be able to extend, not just within the company, but also be able to connect with their peers, their customers, or what have you. So I think the key to the adoption is really, you know, in the environment where uh, you know, what can be done in a safe way. There are compliance issues that can be addressed to. And certainly, uh, time will tell whether these uh, providers out there will be able to appeal uh, to these, uh, you know, this, uh, uh, I, I will guess, uh, you know, users uh, in this area. Yeah, it certainly comes uh, boils down to security and compliance again, isn't it? For something to really take off for the long term. Thanks, Hong Kiet. Right. Uh, this other question from, uh, well, quote, an anonymous attendee. <laughs> when approaching hybrid work, many organizations use multiple tools and platforms. How can technology solutions providers work together to develop a single sign-on system? Is this possible? What are the barriers? Heather, I see you chuckling. <laughs> Please tell us. The biggest unsolved question uh, in my career is uh, how do we solve for single sign-on? Look, uh, this is not an easy one, and I think many providers have a point of view, uh, and they want to be the single source of truth in this space. What I do think, and, and this is not my area of expertise, but we've actually opened up a lot more to allow connectivity. So you can start using various connectors to allow for some single sign-on. There are technologies out there, but it's it's never a simple thing because there's an argument about who's the, the owner of the single identity and wh where's the, the authoritative source of truth. It, it's a very complex issue to solve. Mm -hmm. At a technology level, there are, there's definitely providers. I mean, Google does it, Microsoft does it. There's some open source stuff as well. So it's there, but it's about what works most for you. Sorry, I don't know if that answers your question, but it, it, it's a difficult problem to solve. It is, isn't it? Wan Long, I see you nodding too. Do you have anything to add on to this question? No? Nope. Uh, 
I think same thing as uh, if had a, don't have a solution tough, from right? Google. Don't think anyone That's a tough one to answer. Yeah. Okay. Um, this one for Hongkiet. I want to ask a question for Hongkiet uh, again for our, our anonymous attendee. Please tell us your name. We would love to hear your names, guys. Uh, how can audio actually boost productivity? Thanks. So, quote okay. unquote. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Yeah. You know, when we talk about audio, we have to define is it a good audio or bad audio? And as part of our research that we have done uh, among quite a large group of people across different geographic, one of the very interesting findings that we, we've gotten is that people you know, uh, lose about 29 minutes of their time in a week just meddling with uh, equipment or you know, what have you, getting started on your calls. Uh, and also within the calls, you know, lost connectivity, bad audio, et cetera. Now think about that. 29 minutes, you know, it is a, you know, if you could, if, if you could put a dollar to it, it is also a loss of productivity, so to speak. So we are advocating people to, to you know, as I've earlier also mentioned, empower your sound experience, you know, so invest in, uh, you know, good quality headsets to take away all your pain points, and therefore you will immediately see your, you know, uh, your, your well-being, you know, you're able to hear people better, your, people can hear you better, I think the conversations will get, uh, you know, easier to get, uh, get on. So I think that would, would really be able to resolve. Mm -hmm. I, when you can hear everyone better and communications better, there's just a lot less chance for miscommunication. Anyway, exactly. uh, thank you, Hong Kia. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're coming to the end of this panel discussion. Uh, but before we wrap, I would like uh, some closing one-liners from my panelists today. One long Heather Hong Kia. What do you think would be the next game changer in solving the communications challenge in a hybrid work environment? Uh, one long, let's start with you. Yeah, uh, in my view, I, I think the way to overcome the communication challenges in this our new environment, it's not about solution or product. I mean, just in my view, yeah. I think it's truly about the change of mindset. Yeah. So changing mindsets, you mean getting people to accept that this is a new way of doing things and they just have to be open that, okay, I'm going to be working right. in a pay per minute uh, yes. kind of work, uh, <laughs> co-working space and I'm not going to be going to a physical office for the long term. Right. Okay, mindset change. And Thanks, everyone. And Sorry, that one, one, no. Yeah, I'm just saying, and that will be very powerful because when you have a change of mindset, you will start be really, really uh, you know, accept, acceptance of more type of technology products or even like what uh, Hong Kong is uh, talking about, the, the, the headphone, earpiece, all those things, it will just come to you, right? Yeah. Thank you, Wan Long. Heather? Um, so I had to think about this one a little bit. Um, and I would say we'd need to actually look at solving for the digital divide. And how do we make what we, we accept in our day to day as fully function technology? And we, we heard the varying views on, on how it, good we are. How do we take this fully function, take fully functioning access to some of these technologies onto mobile or low, on mobile or low cost devices in a secure and affordable manner? It might be me coming from my African roots or my emerging market uh, exposure, but I've seen many people over the last year really struggle with one or two devices in a household to serve many family members on quite expensive, high cost bandwidth. So I think if we want to bring more communities together and bring the whole world population, it's going to be one that we're going to need to find some technology solutions for. So it's about narrowing that digital divide to bring more people onto the same bandwidth per se. Yeah. And, and technology on, on different devices, how they work on different devices. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Thank you. On Kiet. Yeah. So firstly, this, uh, let me say that I attest to what Wan Lung say, mindset. And the mindset change is really critical. Now think about having the best technology in the world, but without adoption, now, how can we drive uh, you know, our eye out of it? How can we have learnings, et cetera? But coming back to this question, I mean, from an EPOS uh, perspective, uh, let me just say this. Having a crystal clear communication at a virtual meeting is a good start to an effective meeting. 
but how do we push the boundary of a great meeting? So imagine leveling up your meeting experience with an intelligent audio solution that can transcribe your meeting as if all of you are in the room together. Yes, you heard me, transcribe. And that is record your conversation and translate to usable text or scripts as to who says what. Mm -hmm. This smart application is key to certain industry and can help with compliance. Mm -hmm. So how's that as a game changer? I like that. Transcribe your meetings for you. Transcribe your conversation. That would cut short a lot of uh, the workflow, speed it up a lot. I like that. Thanks, Hong Kiet. And a big thank you to my panelists uh, uh, for panel one, Wan Long, Heather, and Hong Kiet. I think you've shared very, a very wide um, spectrum of perspectives in this panel discussion. Heather from Google, uh, you provided your perspectives from both the technology provider as well as the end user perspective. And Wan Long also talked about the increasing demand for workspaces that are not only extremely flexible, but also intelligent, right? Where technology is part of the work workflow that helps to improve productivity. And Hong Kiet has also clearly highlighted the importance of having really good quality high tech devices that enables you to have a very seamless work experience, whether you're in a hybrid work environment or whether you're a worker on the go. So thank you so much, guys. And thank you to all of you who have also submitted your questions. There are some questions that are more suitable for panel two, so I'll do my best to get to them later on. Okay, thank you so much. Next up, we have Xing Shen, the Vice President of People at South China Morning Post, and she's going to present a general vision uh, showcasing the hybrid work model at South China Morning Post and how South China Morning Post is as empowering its employees to create Asia's leading media brand. So let's see how South China Morning Post approaches hybrid work across its different offices in Asia. Let's take a look. Good day, everyone. I'm glad to share today how South China Morning Post has gone through the journey towards a hybrid work model. It has been planned as a company strategy enabled by the technology and accelerated by COVID. We always believe that flexibility will be the future of work. That's why we have started this journey a few years ago as part of the company digital transformation. One of the milestones is the inauguration of our global headquarters in Times Square here in Hong Kong early 2018. This office was designed to offer a variety of work and social space to be digital, integrated, joyful and agile. Many different facilities are available to enhance this experience for all staff. We have internal staircase that bridge 18 floor to 22 floor, creating a central highway of traffic, starting from the editorial atrium, the beating heart of our news organization. Then we carried on equipping every employee with a laptop, transiting into G Suite, moving everything to be cloud-based. Colleagues can connect and assess from anywhere, no longer restrict, restricted by physical location. As you can imagine, how this enhanced mobility has helped with the coverage of the social movements in Hong Kong back in 2019. It brought greater productivity, not only to the newsroom, but also to the whole company. Of course, not to forget the adoption of the Slack, the instant messaging tool to facilitate the real-time collaboration wherever you are. As in most of the companies in COVID times, we spend months working from home in 2020 to protect our employees. I have to admit, teams have transited to work from home very smoothly, showing amazing agility. We have very quickly adapted to the virtual way of engaging with the employees as well, keeping the spirit of togetherness Town hall have been live streamed from the studio to all the office, Hong Kong, Singapore, China, US, etc. Training sessions have been moved online using a blended learning mo mode. And even activities are conceived to be virtual, online talent show or from home photo competition, etc. During the extended work from home period, we noticed the productivity of the teams did not drop. On the contrary, in many cases, the productivity increased. 
So we felt confident that home can be a viable working location. Therefore, we officially launched the work from home arrangement in November 2020. What is unique about this SMP work from home arrangement is the philosophy that both office and home represent different qualities as a work location. Work, work from home can be a choice based on the work needs and the employees are trusted to make that choice. It is totally flexible when to work from home and for how long, what employees are expected to deliver during the work from home period, etc. All that can be discussed and aligned with the manager. The only thing we needed to keep in mind is that office remains as a primary location as work is a social activity by nature. Therefore, the time split in favor of the office. To deploy the work from home arrangement, we have provided the people managers with intensive workshops as it is a big step for us to evolve towards a trusted based management culture. We are glad to see the work from home arrangement has been adopted by managers and employees very smoothly as it is a natural outcome of a years long plan and efforts. However, the journey never ends. In the new normal, we are facing new challenges. In the hybrid work model, employees may work longer hours at home, they may lack human interactions and or physical exercises. Ensuring employees' well-being, both mental and physical, has become even more challenging. That is why in SMP, we have defined a holistic employee well-being strategy that we are deploying in 2021. In the hybrid model, teams are more distributed. They may be in different locations and in different time zones. Managing a distributed team requires the people manager to proactively plan things ahead to keep team members productive and engaged. People managers will need to double down their efforts in communication to ensure that everybody is on the same page. We are, of course, helping our managers to tackle those challenges. So the journey continues. We are confident that we're progressing on the right track with the right pace. Thank you. Well, thank you, Tin, for that enlightening report. Indeed, the journey continues. If you have any questions for attention, you can input that into the Q&A icon and the South China Morning Team will reply to you by text. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you've been enjoying the conference so far. We are going to go for a quick break as we've come to the end of part one, and we will resume part two at 5.10. So see you soon. It's time to explore your full potential. Set a goal, reach it, and then exceed it. Through the power of audio, we evolve from a mission. We pioneer an audio technology aimed to make you transition. With a deeply rooted passion to perform, we base our know-how on heritage and visionary projection. Crafted to last, designed to excite, a balanced act of perfection. Engineered for people who require reliable connectivity. And those who aim for victory. Developed for those who precisely command the sky. And those who even at a distance feel nearby. Made for those who want to dive into a realm where reality meets imagination. And those who connect across all nations. Immerse yourself again and again until it's time to strike and reign. Created for those who aim to succeed. Unleash your potential. EPOS, the power of audio. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to part two of the EPOS 
virtual conference, the new age of hybrid work. I hope you've had some chance to grab yourself a cup of coffee or tea or something sweet to keep you going for part two of the conference. Now, in the second panel discussion, we want to examine whether the hybrid work model can indeed create a win-win situation for both employers and employees. Now, surveys have showed that hybrid work have caused productivity to more than double, with 80% of workers in Asia saying uh, a, a good work-life balance promotes uh, their well-being and gives them better health. And so the hybrid workplace, which is becoming more widely accepted in the new normal, can certainly benefit employers. Now, we're very honored to have with us today Marla Arnold, the Asia Consulting Leader for Mercer, Professor Lily Kong, the President of the Singapore Management University, and Dr. Ethan Lim, the Head Clinical and Wellness Medical Director at Cigna Singapore. Join us right now to talk about the good Good, the bad, and the uncertainty of hybrid work. Welcome, everyone. Good to have you here with me. So, as a scene setter today, I would like to ask you. Uh, oh, just we haven't we haven't got Ethan on yet, have we? Ethan, you there? Okay, I see you too. Great, wonderful. So, as uh, I want to ask you now, what was the biggest surprise uh, that you saw from the remote work experience in Singapore last year? That was largely driven by the pandemic, and we also had uh, two months of the circuit breaker. So, what really surprised you, Marla? Let's start with you. Sure. Thanks, Yvonne. Pleasure to be here with everybody today as well. Um, I think for me, it's a bit of a plot spoiler for what I'll be speaking about in the second part of this presentation. But for me, what really stood out and surprised me was the fact that employee engagement levels increased uh, during the um, during the pandemic. Um, the results are still out for Singapore specific results. So um, sitting on the edge of my seat to find out how we compare to our global data. Uh, but to know that um, we have uh, seen those results, employee engagement scores increase at such a difficult time um, is fascinating to me. Well, wow, that's really surprising. I wanna come back to you uh, on that one later because uh, what was the reason for this increased engagement? But thank you, Marla. Uh, Professor Lilly, could you tell us what surprised you uh, during last year's um, pandemic in terms of the um, remote so, work situation? Um, again, a, a pleasure to be with everyone. And thank you, Yvonne, for facilitating this. Um, I would say that um, actually the biggest surprise for me is now more than during the pandemic, because what's happened is that people have gotten quite used to working from home and there is a certain reluctance to come back to the office as such. Um, so, you know, from a time um, um, maybe in the middle of last year when people said, oh, when can we get back to the office? Um, there are a lot more people now saying, well, we don't want to get back to the office. How can you change the patterns of work for us permanently? Wow. Yeah, I'm hearing a lot of that too. I know here in Singapore, I think there's a mass call for everyone to return to the office from next week, but uh, I see quite a bit of resistance there. Or like, you know, some people saying, no, I don't want to go back. That's what I've been hearing mostly. Thanks, Professor Kong. Ethan, uh, what, what, what surprised you the most? Well, thank you so much, Yvonne, for having us. And also, it's a pleasure being here as well. Um, I think for myself, the biggest eye-opener surprise was really how big an impact having people stay at home uh, could have on their mental health and physical health. I, think, I don't think anybody would have thought that at home for weeks would change things so much. And I think we will see you know, colleagues and friends around us having changes in their weight, changes coping. <laughs> and, you know, many things, um, finding that working from home wasn't so easy in the beginning because there were things like all oh, the children, bandwidth problems, many, many issues. And then as it went on, people were starting to grapple with their own issues of how being stuck in behind four walls actually affected the mental health so much. And, you know, definitely with a reduction in social interactions. And that really took a toll on many people. And we saw it very much in um, a lot of surveys that came out, even in our Cygnus 360 impact surveys as well. So this was something that was really quite, um, I think, amazing for everybody to see. Yeah, you raised many uh, pertinent points there, Ethan, and we want to get into that during the course of our discussion today. Um, I giggled a little at the pandemic weight thing because you can either have two ends of the spectrum, right? You had the pandemic bod, was it like the dad bot type or like the hot bot type? So that was quite fun. Okay, um, I want to move into this discussion now. 
picking up where you left off, Marla, that increased employee engagement, that is really surprising, right? There was a survey that where it says 94% of employers said the engagement uh, productivity of employees were uh, is the same or if not even higher than pre-pandemic levels. Why? Yes, you're right. And I think the two are closely connected. And uh, we even heard in, in the video just before this of, uh, of Xinjiang uh, saying that at SEMP, in fact, uh, they saw productivity levels stay the same or improve as well. So um, I think it's interesting to see such a wide um, profile of companies uh, experiencing a similar impact. And for me, it comes down to three key reasons. Uh, it comes down to leadership, preparedness, and listening. And I'll go into each of those in a little bit more detail. But from a leadership perspective, um, the pandemic brought about and forced upon new styles of leadership. Uh, leading with empathy or communicating with empathy was one of the key um, words or management styles, not just at the business level, not at the CEO level, but across management um, in general. And I think that really went a long way to, uh, to reassure and engage and support employees. A couple of data points for you. We saw um, at the uh, management level, we saw a 17% increase in manager outreach to their employees during the pandemic. And we also saw a 10% increase in manager one-on-ones with their employees. So we're seeing more connectivity at a time when individuals are uh, less physically connected, uh, which is interesting. Yeah. The second point on preparedness, I think I wanted to point out that hybrid or remote working is not a new concept. Uh, it's just been uh, implemented to varying levels of success in the past. Um, one of the things we talk a lot about at Mercer is the say-do gap. From our research, we know that two thirds of companies previously prior to the pandemic had uh, flexible working policies, but only one third of employees actually felt comfortable requesting to use those policies. So we had a collective readiness, but there were cultural barriers, uh, sometimes individual barriers to being able to use uh, that flexibility. And the pandemic was an equalizer. We all had to go home. We all had to work from home at the same time. Uh, and that removed some of those key barriers of if I'm not seen, will I still get promoted? Uh, or can I still have a, a successful conversation if I'm not physically in the room with somebody? Um, so I think um, preparedness was actually there, but the push to actually do it uh, has, uh, has surprised people that uh, we can evolve that level of trust um, and collaboration um, in a remote environment. And lastly, listening. Um, employee listening has really shown that uh, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. The employers who were most successful at being able to drive that culture of engagement and belonging despite the remote uh, setting were the ones who were listening, running pulse surveys, um, and understanding through informal channels as well what employee feedback uh, and preferences were. I can give you one example from us at Mercer. Um, right at the start of the pandemic, we were all moving to remote from home. We have a flexible spending account as part of our uh, benefit provision here um, that does not cover um, claims for setting up home office equipment. Uh, employees were very quick to provide feedback to management to say, we really want to be able to purchase monitors. We really want to be able to purchase ergonomic chairs. Um, can you help us do that? And management was very quick to respond to make those provisions for us um, and, and allow us to, um, to set that up um, at home. So those types of things build trust and credibility with the employer and ultimately leads to engagement and productivity uh, as the question asked. It's great when you have management that is uh, so proactive isn't it? It really does help to build that trust. And I understand the employee engagement. And I, I think you raised a really important point about uh, cultural barriers to utilizing that flexi work arrangement. And this line that you said, the pandemic was an equalizer. I couldn't agree more. Everybody had to go through the same thing. Thanks uh, for highlighting those points for us, Marla. Before I go to my next question, I just want to encourage our, our audience today, if you have questions for our panelists, do put them in uh, by the Q&A icon and we will get to them during the Q&A segment a little later. Thank you. Uh, Professor Lilly, can I ask you too now, as a leading university in business management, social sciences and computer science, um, what new skills could SMU teach 
a new generation of our workforce when it comes to living in this new age of hybrid work? Um, so thank you for that question, Yvonne. And before I get to that, I just want to say how much I agree with what Marla said earlier. We had exactly the same experiences of, you know, the flexible benefits and how, you know, colleagues can use that differently now to set up home office, etc. And I think that really did go a long way in terms of um, uh, deepening trust and a sense of support. So, you know, Marla, thank you for saying all of that. It's absolutely our experience. Um, just in terms of what a university can do to prepare students better for the world of hybrid work. Um, I would think about it in three ways. One, uh, what kinds of curricula changes we would introduce. Two, what kinds of pedagogical in, uh, differences uh, we would inject into the way in which we teach and learn. And three, let's think a little bit about the core curricula. Um, so first of all, I think there's no getting away from it. If we're thinking about curricula changes, we're gonna need to embed digital competence um, far more than we have had before. So, you know, our core curriculum is changing. We are introducing more courses on digital technology, digital transformation, and understanding the impact of digital change on human individuals. Um, we're introducing new interdisciplinary courses um, and have indeed done so in the last couple of years and speeding that up. So for example, um, digital, core, digital business as a new major, um, accounting cyber risks and forensics as a new major, uh, smart, ma smart cities management and technology, computing and law. So there's no getting away from embedding in the, the curriculum a whole lot more content about digital. But it's also about pedagogical changes, as um, you know, we, we um, have to deliver our classes in different ways, and our students will have to learn to learn in different ways. So, for example, um, getting students working on group projects to learn how to use new digital tools working in groups. So, you know, we all use Microsoft Teams now. How did they pivot? How did they learn to use that? How do they use Slack, for example? How do they use Trello? And we weren't born to know how to use all of those things. And they've had to pick all of that up. Um, and But very importantly, I think we mustn't forget the core curricula that, you know, as um, we all work with, um, you know, the home environment and sometimes that lack of clarity as to when, when is work time and when is downtime, we're all facing that. And how do we prepare our students um, for the next pandemic when they're gonna end up working like that? Um, and disease X, when they're gonna end up working in circumstances where they have to learn to manage their time, manage competing demands. And we've rolled out workshops to try and help them with that. They're also gonna have to learn to work across cultures and across geographies um, under very different conditions. In the past, you could send them for an exchange program. You could send them out to, you know, uh, the neighboring countries for community work and so forth. Now, where are the opportunities for them to learn all of that when you can't travel? And so we've had to find new ways of introducing internships, cross-border internships, cross-border uh, projects with students from other uh, jurisdictions, other uh, universities elsewhere, um, and create new environments for them to learn cross-cultural interactions. Um, and through all of that, whether it's the curricula, the co-curricula, the pedagogy, trying to get them to be more resilient and more adaptable, um, because now it's about learning to work online. Who knows what the next challenge will be? And there's, you know, there's no way in which we're going to be able to anticipate every single change in our lifetimes, they're just going to have to learn to be adaptable. Yeah. And how wow. can we do that as universities? Oh, wow, Lily, thank you so much for taking us through that. It seems really comprehensive, you know, teaching them to uh, manage their time, working cross-culturally, cross geographies. Um, and I have to put up my hand to say, I, I only learned how to use Trello last year as a result of the pandemic. Uh, Slack also a couple of months before that. So it's still a, still a learning curve uh, for us, even though I'm, I'm no longer in school. But since I have you in the spotlight, Lily, can I also ask you then, you've shared with us um, what you could teach, right? New skills that you could teach students uh, in the education sector. Let's move on to the corporate world. What could SMU recommend to companies who may be looking to 
fulfill their employees to achieve a successful transition to hybrid work model, do you think universities have a role to play here? Absolutely. And I really want to thank you for that question, because the traditional model of a university where we're working with the traditional students, meaning the 18 to 24s, I think is going to change. Um, it's changing in Singapore already, where the universities are in the space of providing continuing training for the person who is already in the workforce. And so with this change, with this hybrid work, with digital transformations, with um, greater emphasis on sustainability and all that, universities, I think, absolutely have a role to play. And I would break that down into um, at least two areas. One, um, I think there's a role for us to play in terms of um, preparing our leaders differently our leaders in organizations differently. And um, then, of course, the, you know, at the operational level, how do we prepare, um, upskill, reskill the people who are in the workforce differently? Now, at the leadership level, I would say that, you know, there are many theories about management. Management by walking about is one of them. Now, how do you manage by walking about when you can't walk about, right? And when you think about, um, you know, how to create um, online social connectivity amongst your colleagues, amongst your staff? How do you build community? How do you build platforms for caring and demonstrating that empathy that Marla was talking about earlier? The, the new skills for listening, skills for managing performance remotely. Um, all the literature, all the practices are not about this kind of management. And so um, I think universities can actually be putting out um, you know, executive programs and so forth to help leadership pivot. Mm -hmm. But it's not just about leadership, of course. Universities have a role to play um, in contributing to the upskilling and reskilling at the more operational levels. Mm -hmm. So the digital transformation of business processes is extremely real. Um, the predictable tasks, the repetitive tasks that were done by people on the shop floor, so to speak, um, are now replaced with automated systems. We've all heard the comment about how, you know, was it the CEO or the CIO who en enabled digital transformation? No, it was COVID-19. And so what it means is that things like claims processing or warehouse picking and all that, they've become automated. Now, how do employees train, become trained to work with new automated AI-based systems? Universities play can and must play a role in that upskilling and reskilling. And then of course, um, you know, for, for everybody, whether it's the leadership level down to the last person on the shop floor, how do you learn to manage the work home boundary? How do you use digital tools? How do you project manage online? Um, be more aware of cybersecurity threats um, and um, solutions and be more aware of cyber behaviors, including how to deal with cyber incivility, how to deal with cyber bullying when we're all living online and working online. Now, all these are skill sets um, that can be trained and taught and universities can absolutely play a role in that. So I, I hope very much that universities will pivot um, or pivot more if we've already done the pivoting mm. to playing a role for training, upskilling, um, beyond the education that we've been doing for the 18th to the 24th. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lily. You've certainly highlighted the role that universities can play in both, uh, not just the education sector, but in the corporate sector as well. And I think that I really like that example you raised, you know, having uh, universities putting out these executive uh, leadership programs, teaching leaders how to listen better. You know, empathetic leadership leads to increased employee engagement, isn't it? Thank you, Lily. Ethan, I'd love to bring you into the conversation as well. You mentioned some of the things that surprised you at the beginning uh, of our conversation today. Can you go into a little bit more detail about that? What impact does remote work have on an employee's well-being? Right. Thank you, uh, Yvonne. I, I quite like the balance of this conversation, by the way, because I, I think Mala has brought, and I so agree with her, she, she talked about you know, communication between companies and employees and empathy and getting feedback. And we have ProfCon talking a lot about digital transformation and how you know, businesses need to change and pivot. 
So I'm going to bring it back to the individual <laughs> now, yeah. back to you about health and about people. And I think where we have to recognize with pandemic and the work from home situation is that this is not the normal. And this is really something that the human body and the human mind wasn't equipped to, to adapt to, to be, to be honest. And that's why um, a lot of people were facing a huge amount of stress because they're not adapted to it. They're not used to it. This is something way outside of their routine. They have to learn new skills. They have to learn to adapt to the environment as well. So you will see that this is something really stressful to many, many people. And that stress was something I think people felt it beyond just the mental level. You can see in the physical bodies as well. People are, um, as we said before, you know, there are weight gain and weight loss as well. And much of this um, changes is actually due to our behavioral change as well, as we try to seek new patterns to adapt to these changes. So you will see that there is a shift in how people um, go about their daily lives. They're finding I'm lost, you know, like what Prof Kong has said, finding that work-life balance, right? That's so important for all of us now because we either need to segregate our time or we need to find a space where we can separate our home environment and our work environment. You know, for many other people where they have families and children or pets around that might be dogs barking and all this, you really need to find a space where you can work and you really be in that zone where you can concentrate and focus and be still productive at work. So that's something that a lot of people struggle with. And I think the previous panel was also talking like in Singapore, we, everybody is living in high rise as well. We have their space constraint. So that is something that we all had to figure out a way of finding suitable spaces, suitable time slots, suitable um, jostling for bandwidth, you know, with the family members and everything. So those are the huge stresses that we do face in our daily lives. Then also there are people who, don't, who do not adapt very well to being stuck in a single place. There are people who, because of having to be in the same place for a long time, you see that it changes how they sleep how they eat, um, nutrition, nutritional patterns change. And that's why there, there are people who do not eat very well and they have lost a lot of weight. And like you said, you know, there are people who, because of the stress and the way they adapt to the stress, they're also putting on a lot more weight because they're eating a lot to cope with that kind of changes as well. And we have seen it in many, many instances in all offices throughout um, Singapore and Asia as well. So those... Those are some of the things that you will see people um, changing. You will also see that um, in terms of their um, physical routine in exercise, this is not something that um, people may be able to go to the gym or the, to an exercise park that they're accustomed to. So this disrupts their normal exercise routine. And we all know that exercise has a huge impact on emotional well-being and health as well. So yeah. when that is removed from the equation, you're going to see a lot of people struggling to keep up with this, right? They have to change the routines. They have to find new ways of adapting to exercise. People are going on to Zoom classes. Um, you know, online classes are the rage these days. This, this is the way that we have adapted as well. So I think six months to a year down the road, we have actually found many ways to bring back that kind of interaction by proxy. Some of it through digital means as well, but also in looking at very many ways that we can uh, look for that social um, touch. Uh, I know during the circuit breaker in Singapore, um, a lot of people were using the excuse to go for grocery shopping just to be able to get out of the house. <laughs> but we were all doing that. We were all trying to find some reason to get out of the house because I think being, being in the house for too long really affected um, all of us. And um, even for myself as a personal experience, I didn't realize how much I was affected until I was doing some of these online questionnaires and surveys and they were telling you, oh, how has your life? And I think that sets you thinking and it looks at the insights that you get as you reflect on what has changed in your life. And you realize, hey, I'm actually not feeling in quite a good space that I should be or I usually would be. And that is when people start to recognize that and they start to also look for um, this kind of balance to regain that 
point equilibrium in their mental well-being. Yeah, thank you, Ethan. I, I know I think uh, the past one year has been incredibly challenging for so many of us. And like you said, I, I also use um, exercise as a de-stressor. And I think it's really hard to segregate when do you start work and when do you stop work? Uh, when you have family or you know, other responsibilities all crowded into that one single space. So thank you for highlighting some of these uh, points that you've noted. Uh, on this topic of well-being, I wanna bring Marla back into the conversation because there was another report by Mercer that says that uh, and 43% of employers in Asia have already, or if not, they're in the process of expanding their digital well-being offerings to employees. So what are some of the practical steps that employers can take to um, boost this area, right? Digital well-being for their employees. Marla. Sure, I'll highlight a couple of points. I think it's important to note, building on what uh, Ethan was saying as well, digital is about creating options. It's not a pure shift away from the physical to purely a digital environment. I think having that connection is still going to be important and their individual preference preferences should still dictate where and how people access care and support. Um, digital is creating an entirely new channel for people, especially out of the, uh, out of the pandemic, um, who were less uh, comfortable or not even able to access care and support um, in our more physical world. Um, I think one of the things, um, well, first of all, it's such a hot topic. I mean, um, the, the health tech landscape is just exploding globally. It's not just because we're having this panel today that we know that it's important. Uh, one of the stats that I found fascinating was that of the IPOs and exits last year, um, almost 50% of them came from health tech which was up um, more than double uh, the exits that there were the prior in 2019 um, from health tech. So we know that this is um, shifting the way that investors think about the world. It's shifting the way that governments think about policies. Uh, it's thinking the way, shifting the way that employers think about the support they provide to employees. And it's just democratizing access to care in general. Um, when it comes to um, supporting health, uh, from a digital perspective. The low hanging fruit from what we see typically starts with an EAP and telemedicine. Uh, telemedicine in our book of clients increased fourfold um, from uh, the onset of the pandemic. Um, I think these are both excellent and they're quickly becoming considered a, a, a minimum standard uh, for many companies in the region and globally. I think uh, one of the challenges when you think about a, a, a more holistic um, digital well-being program would be that those um, programs would primarily focus on your employee segments who are either at risk of being unwell or they are unwell. And um, so the beauty of digital is that it brings an entirely new host of options to care for a continuum along the health spectrum, starting with the healthy, where you want to have a more preventative focus, mm. uh, all the way to the more critical end, where you really see the cost impact from a productivity perspective um, uh, and a culture perspective for organizations who have severe cases where they need to bring employees back to work uh, or who are unable to come back to work. Um, so going digital um, is really enabling that uh, continuum of care for the different health status of your employee populations. And I did want to give a shout out to there's some fabulous homegrown health tech uh, right here in Singapore as well. And it's certainly not an exhaustive list, but there are amazing partners right here in Singapore like MindFi, Cognifix, Intellect, uh, New Campus. These are all supporting um, individuals from a retail perspective and employers from an enterprise perspective. Um, to bring, uh, to provide access to care in an entirely new digital framework. Um, the second point that I wanted to um, um, just advise around in terms of introducing digital plans is that um, employers or companies shouldn't expect um, in immediate 100% uptake from day one. Um, there are different levels of adoption and preference for these channels. And uh, one of the best ways that we find uh, employers succeed in driving that adoption uh, is storytelling, having employees themselves share the stories of their, uh, why they use a particular um, uh, platform and uh, where they found success with it. Um, we've, we've also seen that uh, great examples in Singapore as well from the CEO level in accessing mental health care, um, for example. 
uh, very publicly. Um, and so in addition to the storytelling, micro learning opportunities. Um, so it's not as intimidating if you're giving, creating an environment where employees can test um, these different platforms, um, then they'll become more comfortable uh, to be able to call a doctor using telemedicine um, mm -hmm. on their own. Um, so it is a process. Um, I know uh, it, it takes an investment from employers. So I appreciate that and often, Budgets are very quickly tied to utilization and to uptake and adoption. Um, but uh, HR teams primarily who are taking the lead on introducing the, the digital um, um, health care uh, really need to manage expectations and to appreciate as well that it will take a runway approach uh, and that digital won't always be for everyone. So digital is more, uh, I, I like that it, it offers a lot of options, but it does take uh, quite a few hands to clap to make sure that it works and it takes off as well. So thank you, Marla. Very quickly, a question for uh, Lily before we hit to the Q&A because we are running out of time. Lily, I wanna ask you, you know, what are some of the permanent changes that a hybrid model will bring uh, to teamwork uh, from a researcher's point of view? Because I think, um, when we are in this hybrid work environment, it's so hard when you're not physically in the same space with your team members to get a project off the ground. Right. Um, so in, in one sense, I, I worry about talking about permanent changes because um, there's probably nothing permanent about changes anymore. Yes. They get overtaken uh -huh. by other changes and new ways of working will yet emerge. But um, very quickly, just in terms of the current changes that we confront, that we are confronted with right now, um, I think Assuming that the question is about what would researchers actually contribute, uh, what, or what would researchers be able to contribute to um, uh, enhance the work environment and, and the hybrid work environment, I'd say that, you know, um, a lot of how we work is not just about the deliberate organized uh, sessions where we meet and so forth. It's also very often about the serendipitous encounters, the chance conversations in the elevator at the uh, water cooler and so forth. And so if we're in a hybrid mode, what you're going to find is that that element um, would be lost to quite a large extent. So as a researcher, um, I would say that we need to understand what is the nature of those serendipitous encounters and how can we create uh, platforms, new platforms, which allow for that kind of serendipity. What are the virtual public spaces that can be created? What are the virtual water coolers and pantries? <laughs> Uh, that might be created to enable that kind of chance encounters as such. Um, at the same time, I would say that, um, you know, very often uh, digital communication is good for um, conveying simple ideas, um, but complex idea sharing and complex idea creation is much more effectively done, I think, via face to face interactions, because through face to face interactions, you can have multimodal interactions. There's not just speech which the virtual platform captures, but the body language, there is whiteboarding and sketching and doodling along the way that allows ideas to come together. And so in hybrid work situations, you will have potentially an in-group and an out-group situation. The group in the room is able to have all these elements and the group that's attending virtually is out of it. It's the out-group. And so we need to design virtual workspaces. Researchers need to design virtual workspaces that accommodate both the physical and the virtual workers so that the benefits of face-to-face -face can be felt and enjoyed by everyone and you don't have an in-group and an out-group. Um, researchers need to also study how leaders can effectively energize team members to manage conflict, to establish successful interaction norms, et cetera. And a lot of existing research is premised on in-person arrangements. Mm. There's much, there's a far greater need to understand what is effective when it's a hybrid situation or a virtual situation. And if the researchers can, um, you know, sort of contribute perspectives, we can take these perspectives into the executive programs that I was talking about, yep. into the skills training programs that I was talking about, and hopefully contribute to a better work experience. Yeah. Amazing insights uh, you've just shared there, Lily. Lots of takeaways. I, I really like the point of virtual workspaces and making sure that in-group and out-group dynamic 
it works, right? You don't want to have the, you can't sit with us kind of approach because you're part of that group and not mine. Thank you, Lily. I want to quickly go to the Q&A. Uh, this question for Ethan, is there a checklist for employees themselves to keep track of their well-being in a hybrid work setting? Ethan. Yeah, I, I definitely think that's- Just to ask yourself, yeah? Yeah, that's um, a lot of questionnaires out there, but I think very simple things for people to look at would be, are they feeling all right? You know, are they feeling like they are in a good space and a good time to work and to be at work and be productive as well? So there are many things, I think there are many tools um, online that you can see. There are questionnaires about your mental resilience, emotional stress. Uh, we have a stress care visualization for that as well. But more importantly, I think um, sometimes people may not be aware or may not like even for somebody who may be very aware of what's happening, they may not actually do that check in on themselves. So it's always good to have people check in on you as well. And that's something that we do emphasize quite a bit um, to do regular check ins with your co workers, with your colleagues, um, with your team members. And I think some of the things, uh, quick, quick tips on that, there's um, the appearance you look at. If somebody is always looking very tired, always stressed out, or there are even signs of like substance abuse. Some, somebody always going for a boost or drinking. <laughs> that is maybe a sign that they're not uh, coping very well. Then you can also look at performance as well, right? Change in work habits, um, how they are doing things and their performance. And they're, maybe they're putting in too much extra effort during this period of time. And you can see this is not the norm. But they're just not doing as much. And so there is there is that change in behavior as well. And or look at how they respond to challenges. I think this is where when there are new opportunities and people don't respond in the usual manner. And there may be also something that um, there is that boredom that's setting in or something that's affecting their interest. Um, one of the very interesting things is also you can think about looking at um, how they communicate when people start to have outbursts or become much more emotional than they usually are. This is also where their effect control can be, uh, means that they're very stressed, you know. So this is something a good check. If you're real, realizing you're speaking a lot faster and more agitated than you usually are in a conversation, that may not be a good sign. And of course, relationships, how people relate to each other. Um, some people, as they get more stressed, the way that they relate to people starts to break down, they, they start to become more withdrawn or they change the way they may become male manic as well. So this is a good mnemonic, APGAR. Um, it introduced in the 1950s as a stress APGAR barometer. So A-P-G-A-R. So we talk about appearance um, with performance, growth tension. We also talk about effect control and relationships. So those are the good mnemonic to remember on that. Yeah. Thank you, Ethan. Yeah, some really great tips there. If you're starting to, uh, great signs for us. I mean, personally, if I were to notice someone uh, hitting the booze too much or looking very wan or just being very snappy. Those are some alarm bells. So thanks, Ethan. Uh, this other question from our anonymous attendee, what are the creative ways you've seen in the region that can keep the team morale high despite physical distance and potential communications challenges? Marla, you want to take this one? Sure, and I think uh, we, we're all living in the environment, so happy for uh, Prof Kong and Dr. Lim to pitch in as well. Um, there were some great examples, actually, in uh, Chen Sheng's um, video that she shared prior to this as well, but um, I think certainly there are, I, I think keeping it lighthearted, um, bringing in a sense of humor and uh, getting to know an individual um, perspective um through 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 um in our in our new remote working one of the some of the things that we've done on our team are um the bake-offs we've done um virtual housewarming parties we've done um um the the check-in fitness zoom sessions uh, sorry fitness zoom sessions in the mornings um I think there's a, a lot of really great examples out there, even from a, a travel perspective. I know um, there's uh, one of the for one of the companies is doing um, travel to they've popped up all over the place, but uh, virtual travel to Nigeria, for example, was the one uh, that uh, that this firm did with their employees. Uh, visit to a um, a petting farm, a, a petting zoo farm. 
um, where you actually get to go and meet the animals up close thanks to um, Zoom technology. So uh, there's all sorts. I think the imagination is the limit of uh, the sky's the limit wherever your imagination can take you. But there are all sorts of ways. Um, and I think the best way is to crowdsource and ask your teams uh, to yeah. come up with ideas, suggest what they would like to do as well. Crowdsourcing, absolutely. I love that idea. Um, there's a, the, uh, the, recently the Louvre also allows people to go in and see some of these go in, right? To see some of the uh, prized arts, uh, prized works on display. Thank you, Myla. We've got this question for Professor uh, Kong. Uh, she wanted for uh, Michael wanted to follow up on one of your talking points. How would you promote inclusivity and build a sense of belonging in teams in a hybrid work setting? How do you upskill and what kind of skills people managers need to adopt so that they can facilitate that? Um, those are great questions. Thank you, Michael. Um, I would say that you know some of what Marla said earlier is is so important. Um, demonstrating the empathy, building the trust. Um, and, and of course, it helps a great deal if the trust is already there. But if not, I think we'd need to do that in a hurry. Um, but definitely manifesting the empathy. Some of the um, strategies or the tactics that we've used, so to speak, would be, um, you know, we've, we've organized sessions to um, have dinner together. Um, so we've had dinner sort of uh, just, you know, delivered to people's houses and it's not tied to any meeting and um, we just eat together and chat together. We've even tried to sing together. That was a, an abysmal <laughs> failure. Um, at National Day um, in, in 2020, mm. Singapore's National Day, um, you know, we, we kind of decided that we'd come together and we would sing uh, uh, um, you know, some, some songs together, our National Day songs together, and we would actually record ourselves. And we thought that we might actually share that with the larger community. Um, and after we heard ourselves, we decided we wouldn't, but we had a good laugh about it. <laughs> Um, and, and, you know, exactly as um, Marla says, it's, it's creating those environments where um, you can relax together, you can laugh together, including at yourselves. And that creates a sense of inclusivity because, um, you know, you don't necessarily see your boss doing that uh, all the time. Um, yeah. And the willingness to kind of let your hair down um, is, is part of that building of social capital mm. um, as such. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. Social capital and what Marla said earlier, just bringing in that humorous element, right? Seeing people in a different setting uh, endears you to one. So there's less of a, like that stranger barrier. I want to ask now, do you, I mean, based on what we've discussed so far, a question for my panelists, do you agree that companies and employees then stand to get the best of both worlds by this continued hybrid work environment? Marla? Um, so in short, I think there is a win-win for everyone, um, but it's, the current model is not sustainable. We need to shift to an environment where uh, we, are, we are acknowledging that um, the pandemic or the effects of the pandemic have been disproportionate for particular um, segments of the population, and we need to address that. Um, caregivers, for example, um, singles who are isolated and don't have as much, much social contact, um, just uh, Gen Z and pre-retirees who have uh, uh, financial wellness concerns and job stability concerns. We really need to um, remember that there are diverging populations coming out of this and make sure that we have policies, programs, and practices that are going to support in a new hybrid environment. When we have that, there can be a win-win for everyone. Thank you, Marla. Really well said. So we're not there yet. Um, it's, the current model is not sustainable and a lot more can be done. Ethan, your thoughts on this, please. Yeah, I, I totally agree, with Marla. I think we have still quite a way to go. And I think keeping in mind that this is still an evolving situation, you know, with next week, um, the government has said that 75% of people can go back to the office. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's it going to introduce more dynamics and you will see a lot more changes across the whole landscape as well. There will be employers who would want more of their employees to come back and there will be some which still um, allow their employees to have that flexibility and creativity to work as when when they want. So I think that we're we going to see a, a greater divergence in the market and what people will need and what people will want as well. So definitely we're not quite there. And I think we haven't quite reached that point where we know the balance of what works well for each organization and company as well. 
So you're, you're bracing yourself to see even more divergence going forward. Thanks, Ethan. So. Lily, what do you think? This is hybrid work. Is it the best of both worlds? Win-win? So, so I, I'm going to sound like a parrot because I completely agree with Marla and <laughs> Ethan that, you know, the potential is there, but we haven't, um, we're, we're not at the sweet spot yet. The potential is absolutely there. Um, and so the organization that's going to be able to optimize the hybrid work is one that recognizes that um, there isn't a one size fits all for all employees. Mm -hmm. Different employees will be in um, different circumstances and what works for one group may not work for another group. Mm -hmm. um, and the organization that's able to balance it all and optimize it is going to is going to be the winner as such. Um, but it's a difficult journey and we're definitely not there yet. But you're there to support them for sure. Indeed. <laughs> right. So very quickly, that one piece of advice um, for companies right now that are looking to implement hybrid work for the long term. If you only had one piece of advice, Marla, what would it be? Employee listening. Survey, listen, hear, and get feedback from your employees. Employee listening. And thank you. Ethan, one piece. Mm -hmm. Do this together. I think that's most important. You're all in it together. Do it as a group. The employers, employees, everybody has to be in it together. Like we always say in Signal, right? Together all the way. So really just bring everybody on that journey to understand each other, be closer, be more empathetic, and really show that concern and that sharing of vulnerabilities. It, it is everybody in this together. Mm. Engaged listening and doing it together. Thank you, Ethan. Lily, your one piece of advice. Okay, this is this is tough. Um, I'm I'm gonna cheat and I'm gonna say it all very quickly so it sounds like one piece one of advice, but it's actually <laughs> <Okay>. multiple parts. <laughs> um, set clear priorities. Um, be inclusive and flexible. Introduce introduce fun and team building opportunities. Build trust. Um, and and as we've already heard, keep a very close eye on employee well being. That that was like one sentence. Yes, you said it pretty fast. I got I got all that. Yes, inclusivity. Keep it fun. Right, and keep an eye on employee well-being. Uh, Marla, Lily, Ethan, thank you so much for sharing your expertise and your experience with us today. Some wonderful insights there. I was furiously taking notes. Um, yeah, Marla, you clarified some of the misconceptions of hybrid work. You know, such as one has to be seen in order to progress in the company. And I think you've really shared some best practices when it comes to employee benefits, well-being programs, and even HR policies that could be easily incorporated in a company's business transformation journey. Uh, Professor Kong, you've highlighted you know, the importance of reskilling, not just in the education sector, but in the corporate world as well. And you've also given us a glimpse of what our future workplace will look like, and we have to make sure that we are ready for that. Thank you. And Ethan, you've also brought up some really amazing tips today, very useful ones on how employers can create a more enabling environment for its employees and what we as, as colleagues and friends uh, and uh, family members can look out for when others may be in distress. And it's really about, you know, just checking in on the other person. So I thank you so much for this wonderful session. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for sticking with us. I'd now like to welcome back Xia Hongkiet, the Vice President of Enterprise Solutions APAC at EPOS for his closing keynote. Hongkiet, please. Thank you. Thank you, Yvonne. Uh, what an insightful sharing from all expert panelists. I've learned a lot, and I hope you have as well. If I may sum up, hybrid workplace model seems to be the new norm, and it's fast becoming a workplace reality that we are looking at in 2021 and beyond. No matter where you are in, your terms, in terms of a digital workplace maturity, be it in the early phase or midway, to prepare for a hybrid workplace, a great digital employee experience is key. In our approach and mindset to this new way of work, it is important to strive a good balance between remote work and physical work experience. EPOS is here to be a relevant piece of the new age of hybrid work. I would like to leave this message to all our guests today. Empower your sound experience. You deserve excellent audio to unleash your potential at work, wherever that may be. So do check us out at eposaudio.com. Before we end, let me say a few words of thanks. On behalf of EPOS, I would like to thank the team from South China Morning Post for their relentless effort in putting this show together. 
Special thanks to our beautiful host, Yvonne, for driving and steering and impactful sharing among our distinguished panelists. Lastly, to you, our audience, thank you for taking time to attend today's conference. I wish everyone a good Easter holiday ahead. Take care and stay safe. Back to you, Yvonne. Hey, thank you so much, Hong Kiat, for that very succinct conclusion to a very insightful conference today. Ladies and gentlemen, I do hope that uh, the content that's shared today will help you broaden your horizons and also enable you to thrive in the new age of hybrid work. Before we let you go, just a few quick words from EPOS. Based on their pioneering audio technology, EPOS strives to unleash the human potential by perfecting your audio experiences. So if you're looking to move your business to the hybrid space and you want more information, you can go to eposaudio.com. And if you'd like to explore how audio shapes our experiences and find out how the future of audio is being created, you can listen to the Powered by Audio podcast on the EPOS website or on the Apple podcast or on Spotify. And before you go, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love for your feedback to tell us how this this conference went for you today. So do scan the QR code on your screen to complete the short survey for us. And you can also connect with EPOS on LinkedIn or on Facebook to keep up to date with some of the latest developments and news. Once again, my name is Yvonne Chan. On behalf of EPOS and South China Morning Post, I thank you for staying with us today and I wish you a great rest of the week. Stay safe. Goodbye. I'll see you next time.